Welcome everybody. This is General Microsoft 365 Development Special Interest Group, and this is the bi-weekly sync. It is May 28th, 2020, uh, and we are thrilled to have a really interesting call again today. Uh, we're going to quickly go through again in the first 15 minutes. This is always our kind of a target, the latest on the open source projects which we're executing, so what's happening there. And then we have three super cool demos available uh, today related to multiple different areas in Microsoft 365. So, First of all, uh, Bert is going to do a nice preview on upcoming CSAM.NET standard version. So the CSAM.NET standard will give you then the capabilities of implementing uh, C-sharp code, which is running in Azure Functions, uh, the newer versions of Azure Functions, and then connecting to the SharePoint APIs if you need to use uh, any other APIs which are not yet available in Microsoft Graph. Now, really important thing, Microsoft Graph absolutely should be your default go to friend and API surface, but if there's an API which is not yet available in Microsoft Graph, then if you need to fall back on CSM, and now that we're getting a CSM.NET standard available, that will enable you to do that, and that's really, really cool. ETA, by the way, for that release uh, is roughly on mid-June, so it's happening quite soon. Uh, we're hitting June starting from the weekend, I think, unless I'm completely mistaken. The second demo is from Tommy Gerlis uh, from uh, Solvion, building Microsoft Teams tabs with Blazor and ASP.NET Core 3.1. Really cool setup as well. Uh, really cool to see the placer in action. Um, and it's actually really waiting for that one, uh, how it will look like and what's the learnings from uh, Tommy on that one. And then uh, as a last, but definitely not the least, uh, Yannick uh, Plenivox is gonna talk about site designs for power users with Site Design Studio. So there is a new version of the Site Design Studio, which is an open source product and uh, done by uh, uh, Yannick. And V2 is really, really, really cool. Uh, so we're gonna have roughly 10 to 20 minutes booked uh, for that one. And then we're gonna close on the hour today as well. Now let's actually keep uh, moving on the slides. Uh, so quick recap opportunities on participating with the community. You can demo or technical uh, demo a solution or technical patterns. So please uh, reach out to any of the BNP team members and then we'll get you scheduled on any of this upcoming course. We are booking already calls in July. So please, please, if you're kind of a should I or should I not, reach out and then we'll figure out what is the right next available call which is matching your schedule. You can contribute in GitHub uh, by contributing with pull requests or an issues and the most important thing always is provide feedback, provide feedback, provide feedback. Um, if you don't like something, if you like something, let us know. We know where we are um, investing our investments or where we are focusing our investments. Super, super important thing. Um, something you don't like, let us know. Something you like, please let us know as well. Now, uh, quick recap on our assets as well. We have the official Microsoft 365 developer video channel. We have all of the, the community call videos from across the Microsoft 365 channel. We have our Microsoft 365 SharePoint community PMP videos where we have a lot of MVP videos as well. So we're promoting our individual community members there and non-dev videos as well. So we have Mark Cashman and DC Butter and all many of the other uh, non-dev people um, releasing videos there as well. So giving you insight sides of what's happening within the platform. We have multiple different open source assets and, and uh, GitHub organizations available. There's sample galleries, which you definitely want to have a look as well when you're looking into making something happen rather than starting from scratch. Go and have a look on if there's a sample available and then start by extending the sample or taking the sample or if this is open source for you to take advantage. If you're looking into what is all of the things what we're doing within the Microsoft 365 from a community and open source perspective, go to the AKMS M365 BMP, it will list you all of the initiatives, all of the community calls, all of the other things uh, which you should be aware related on the stuff what we are sharing. Everything is free, everything is for you to use any way you want. Um, all of the slides and everything is available for you to use any way you want. Like. Um, related on that one, just a recap from the last time as well, AKMS M365 uh, BMP is the new a uh, landing page for the Microsoft 365 Patterns and Practices, our community and open source supports, and that lists all of the things what we're doing. If you're missing something, let us know. If you want to have something additional on that page, let us know as well. So we want to have a one page which is easily approachable, which gives you all of the, the information what is needed for you. Um, quick recap also on the, well, not a recap, this is an ongoing thing which is evolving all the time. So we want to help those people who are not super familiar with the GitHub and the contribution ways of how to, how to get started on the community. And there are multiple initiatives on this side. 
and you can find more details from AKMS sharing is caring is the redirection and that's going to land you on the page which you can see on the right side of the screen and and uh, right now the next first time contributor session is on June 1st uh, so please go there register today it is a great way for you to learn how to contribute in GitHub we do understand that it's 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 an area where people are not necessarily that familiar but it's certainly a, a a really powerful way of contributing, getting more closely involved, and then helping others in the community as well. So have a look on that. AKMS sharing is caring is the address. Now, let's go to the BMP some core and let's do a quick recap uh, all the changes in here by Birch. Uh, oh, Paolo, not sure if Paolo Yeah, okay. Well, I can Either cover way. the first part. I can cover go, the first go part. Ahead. If, can do the, what yeah. if we all talk at the same time? That's, yeah, let's uh, try to do that. Let's go, Bert. <laughs> 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 okay, let's stop. Uh, okay, uh, so in May we released the uh, PMP system core library on the 12th of May with some updates, including uh, the capability to retrieve users from Azure Active Directory, and we improved the support for provisioning teams uh, with app only tokens as well as some other interesting stuff in the fields of Microsoft 365 groups. This week uh, on May 26, we uh, released a refresh of PMP system core library, mainly to include some uh, uh, additional bug fixings and to include uh, the capabilities that I showed you a couple of weeks ago in the fields of provisioning sites and teams all together within a unique uh, uh, provisioning template, as well as uh, a fix uh, to better support uh, the setting of a classification property on a modern team site uh, created with uh, uh, PMP PowerShell. And what else, Bert? Uh, what else? So we have uh, also released a preview, an early, early preview of our uh, new PMP Core SDK, which is a graph first uh, lightweight library uh, targeting to kind of unify graph and SharePoint REST as in one model for you as a developer. Um, you can find it in the PNP org uh, under PNP Core. Um, so open. Feel free to kind of play around, provide feedback. Uh, it's really early, so but uh, if you're interested in, in seeing the code and seeing how it works, think, go ahead and try it out and, and contact us uh, for more information. And then uh, future-wise, um, with, uh, with the system for the standard uh, around the corner, uh, we also will be working uh, on a, a V4 of PNP size core and a V4 of PNP PowerShell which will use that the new uh, uh, system for the standard. So essentially uh, shipping those libraries as cross-platform libraries uh, and doing some cleanup, some, some maintenance work there. We'll drop some old, very old things, but, but overall most things will stay in there. But then you'll get like a library that, that can be run across uh, uh, everywhere essentially. That's right, it for now. I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm just gonna recap quickly on the on the PMP uh, core, just to kind of re reiterate that one. So that is a Microsoft Craft first extension library where you can actually it has its own um, basically domain model and it uses Microsoft Craft. But whenever you hit an API or a property which does not exist in a Craft, it's gonna fall back on season. So this way uh, you rest. don't have to worry about. Sorry. Or rest. Yeah, absolutely. On rest uh, in this particular case. Thank you, Bert, for clarifying that. Really, really, it's intended to be a, a uh, open source initiative to help people to use the craft. But then, if craft is missing something, you, you don't have to worry about how to fall back on the on the previous site. Now, let's go to the uh, PMP PowerShell. I think Irvin is on the house. Yep. 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 Actually, unfortunately, not too many updates. So there were some unfortunate circumstances that uh, made us not do any updates to PNP PowerShell. Unfortunately, uh, though, all the changes that were made to PNP at core, obviously every month automatically drilled down to PNP PowerShell. So all the things that Paolo just, for instance, mentioned, they're now part of PNP PowerShell. So next, please, June, we will have way more changes coming and updates. And, and as Pat mentioned also now that we have a season for the net standard, on the very near horizon, that will also mean that PMP PowerShell will come to PowerShell 7. Uh, and that means that you can run it on basically every platform their PowerShell runs on, including Azure Functions V3. And now that so I'm, we're nice. mentioning that, well, I think we have a two weeks from now, we're going to talk about this in more detail with the demos and all of that, unless I'm completely mistaken. I think it's two weeks from now in the calendar. Mm, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And then, uh, that's it, right? Uh, so let's go to the modernization tooling. Yes, modernization. Uh, so for the May release, um, which was already out for like May 12th, uh, 
there were some fixes, no major, major changes there for the, the page transformation engine, so the one that kind of transforms any classic page into a modern page. And on the horizon there is still the, the idea of, of enabling page transformation from non-SharePoint sources, so like reading like a media wiki uh, content and creating a SharePoint page from that, but that's still far right, we have to think about that. Uh, but. Uh, what I did actually do is just release uh, Monetization Scanner version 2.11. So that was released last week, Friday, with some bug fixes uh, and integration of a new API called the, the Can Modernize Homepage API, which uh, kind of checks actually like, can my is my homepage eligible for a, um, a default homepage modernization? So that there's a feature that we are about to roll out, uh, and that will kind of flip your homepage from classic to modern if it has not been customized. And this API will tell you whether that homepage will be uh, eligible for the change, yes or no. Um, yep, and then for the rest, I think it's the usual stuff as that Dello blocks are going away. Uh, if you still use them, you have to migrate them to, to modern pages and yeah, that's about it. Now, re related on the modernization thing, just a, a side note and a small teaser, because I saw this pretty recently in a, in a one channel. Uh, we're also looking into pretty soon actually release, uh, or so it seems, the capability of transforming any classic team site to be a communication site, which is actually pretty cool. So, uh, Yes, that's actually already in, in our guidance, in our end-to-end -end modernization is, scripts. It but is, we so. did we did Never remove really that native that. feature. We, no, no, we did remove that native feature and it was in halt and Melissa is pushing that now out uh, again, probably uh, pretty soon. So, so that's pretty cool as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, your teams, Victor, I'm, I wasn't 100% sure if you're in the yeah. call. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yes, brilliant. Yes, so we brilliant. had yet another One great more. month. Uh, since our last call, we released version 2.14. Uh, which we had in preview last time, so support, full support for schema version 1.6, uh, including the loading indicator, a couple of things. There are some breaking changes if you do upgrade a project, otherwise you don't have to care. Uh, but the cool thing is that we are going through the roof when it comes to usage now, so it's over 67 or 63 percent month over month, and we still have a few more. We have a weekend full of teams development, so we'll probably go over that. So. It's really good uh, usage of Teams now. So it's not just people installing the generator, but actually people generating projects. So that's really cool. Yeah. We have 2.15 in the pipeline. Uh, there are a couple of pull requests we need to that fix the smaller things or some smaller feature requests and upgrades of features. Uh, planning version 3 has been uh, on my backlog for some time right now. Uh, too much work to do, but yeah, summer holidays coming up. So uh, over the summer, we work out version 3, I guess. And as usual, um, come with feedback, uh, contribute with pull requests as have been done over the last few weeks. That's awesome. And looking forward to more Teams dev. Yeah, it's it's absolutely great to see the, I, I love the rocket, by the way, which you found <laughs> from some clip art uh, uh, storage. No, that's uh, my hand drawing. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but, but I have to say that the, the chart is looking pretty awesome. So it's good to see that people are finding the ways of extending Microsoft Teams and, and obviously just to, uh, we, we did release in the Microsoft Build a preview version uh, of the, the Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio Tooling. Exactly. Obviously, they are complementary tools, and the Yo Teams um, is, is definitely and has been available for what, a few years already? Three um, years. Three years. And, and you're using TypeScript in here, and, and it's being used widely across the world. Now, whatever we, we also uh, release from a Microsoft perspective, uh, from the Teams organization, those will be obviously coming as a additional tools available for you as well. They have a slightly different perspective. Uh, as an example, the, the Visual Studio code tool is, is JavaScript based. So if I use the TypeScript, then definitely your Teams is the option. If you prefer to be in a JavaScript, maybe that's your option as well. So again, not a competition, they're complementary tools between each other. Cool. Uh, I think that's it for now. And I think we'll go back on Bert's uh, screen uh, for a few slides. And then uh, Bert is going to actually do a few demos. Actually, before we go there, uh, I'm sorry. There's a good question from Nick. I want to address that. What is the recommendation to create new Teams application and tabs? Is SPFX or native Teams app? Um, it's actually up to your chosen path. So again, if you have an existing website. If you're willing to host uh, the website in Azure and you have all of the, all of the existing SaaS service available, absolutely you can surface that as a Microsoft Teams um, tab or a Microsoft Teams uh, personal application. Now, 
if you have an existing LOB implementation, if you have an existing, let's say, web parts, you can surface those as an implementation also in the in the teams. Again, complementary things. These are not which of these is the best option. It really depends on your skill set, your team skill set, and what is the suitable tooling for your objectives. So it's not either one of them, it's it's all of them as a chosen whatever suits for you. Now let's get back to you. I'm uh, sorry, Bert, on the on the CSM.NET standard. Really cool stuff as well. So yep. take it away. All right. So on the slide, uh, you see a bit of .NET uh, history, uh, just kind of setting the scene. Um, so today, uh, CSM.NET works for .NET Framework. And .NET Framework has been around for like a long, long time already. But today, version 4.8. Uh, now, Microsoft started building .NET Core um, in parallel. We just like the cross-platform version of .NET Framework. Uh, and then we acquired Xamarin. So we had three different streams of .NET development and, and tools going on. Um, now, with .NET 5, which is uh, still planned for this year, we finally will unite all these three. So there is no .NET Framework anymore, no .NET Core, no Xamarin. Everything will be bundled in one .NET 5 version, which does support everything that was there from the past. Everything that's still relevant uh, will be supported. Now, the good thing is with our new friend, CSM for .NET Standard, uh, we can play a role in, in everything, essentially. Everything in the red boxes is, is possible. There might be some exceptions, like, uh, for example, Blazor. We have to ch check whether that works with Blazor properly due to the way how the HTTP stack is being used. But overall, it should work uh, on most platforms, most tools, most environments. And then, uh, as I already mentioned with Vesta earlier on, uh, it enables certain scenarios. Cross-platform, yes, great one, uh, important. But I think the more important one of the bigger ask that I've been hearing about is Azure Functions v2, v3. Um, so uh, PowerShell uh, that can run on those functions. So, And all of these things become uh, possible now with the uh, CSM Potter and Standard. Now, there are differences. It's like 99% the same, but the 1% still matters. So uh, let's try to explain what's the differences. First of all, uh, SharePoint on-prem support is not there. So CSM 410 standard will only work for SharePoint online. We're not shipping this for SharePoint on-premises. So if you use SharePoint on-premises, you still have to stick with regular.NET um, uh, CSM versions. Another important one is legacy auth flows. So uh, I guess most of you have played around with SharePoint Online credentials when you kind of connected, created your, your CSOM uh, context. Uh, that is not there anymore. Uh, instead, uh, you have to use access-based authentication, access token-based authentication. Uh, and the demo that I will show in a second will really walk you through how to do that. It's really easy, uh, uh, but there's a difference. So you have to change your code a little bit to kind of to make that work. The safe open binary direct methods, so the ones that, that depend on web dev, they are not there anymore as well, uh, which makes sense because they depend on legacy auth and cookie authentication systems. So, but there are regular file methods to do those things, so nothing problematic. We dropped the HTTP utility class. It was mainly used for kind of uh, a URL decode, uh, HTML encode decode related things, which can be done with the regular system web HTTP utility stuff. So. It shouldn't be a big problem for, for most uh, people. And then the last one is we completely dropped the uh, Microsoft SharePoint client event receivers namespace. Uh, that was there to support uh, uh, the old event receivers, async synchronous event receivers. Uh, now, obviously, we have webhooks in modern development, which is the way to go. But I'll have to check like uh, what's the reasoning behind fully dropping this because it's not really clear to me. Maybe there is this wasn't really the plan. But let's let's see. But for now, it's it's gone at least. But again, like probably no, it's really limited use, so it's not really a big problem for most folks. Okay, um, now let's um, do a bit of demo. First, go to here, Azure Active Directory. Uh, why? Uh, we need to do access access token based authentication, and what's the the way to get an access token? Is to define application Azure Active Directory. So let's quickly do that and show you how simple this is. So um, let's go to Azure Active Directory. Let's go to App Registrations. New registration. Let's give it a name. Uh, SIG demo. Uh, today we are 28, I think. Whatever. 28.05. OK, hit register. I'm not doing any redirect URIs, just register this one. 
Okay, we have an application. We need to do some basic configuration. First of all, um, we have to give it some permissions. Okay, add permission. Um, we're in SharePoint land today, so SharePoint. Um, Telling it the permission, all sides. Let's take this one, manage. Okay, add permission. At this point, my application will be able to uh, manage SharePoint sites that I can access. So I still need to grant admin consent or as user consent, need to consent to the application. So that's done, all good. Then one last thing that I have to do is if I go to the authentication tab, since uh, I will be using a, a password credential flow, an owner password credential flow, um, I need to enable this as a default uh, public client like this, save, and that should be it. So this is a one-time effort that you have to do uh, that you can do with your uh, Azure AD admin, uh, configure one application, give it the proper permissions. You can also give it additional permissions for graph, uh, for example, if you combine things. Uh, so I just give SharePoint permissions, but you can do more there. Uh, now I have an application available. Um, let's copy my uh, client ID to the clipboard. All right, and then let's go to Visual Studio. Here on Visual Studio, I'm gonna First of all, quickly paste this uh, new application ID over here. So I don't forget to do that. All right. And then let's have a look at the code. All right. So application wise, uh, this looks quite like CSOM. Well, why? Because well, it is CSOM, right? So we have uh, a site that we want to uh, access in my tenant uh, slash site slash prof dash one. I have a user and I will ask a password for my user account. Then I will be creating a CSOM context, a client context. Now, in this case, I'm using a helper class to do that. And we'll kind of go into the details uh, once we, we run the demo there. And then once you have the context, which is special in this case, because we have to handle the access token uh, request and plug in the access token in, in, in the, the call back to SharePoint, but that's the only difference. Everything else is the same. Everything else just is CSOM like you used to be work with CSOM. You uh, you load, uh, you, actually, you run execute query. There's execute query async, which is already there in the current version, but which is recommended way, uh, I think, for most developers. And then you run. So I'm going to uh, actually, let's go over here to the get context method in the authentication manager class. Things to, to take into account, uh, first of all, when you create a new client context, you have to turn off forum digest handling enabled. I gave feedback to the developers so to potentially just set this off by default because it makes no sense to have it on anymore. Um, so uh, it should always be off. Uh, if you forget this, you might uh, get some issues. So, so think about that. And then uh, to uh, kind of uh, embed the access token that you acquire, uh, you have to add a bearer, um, authorization header uh, with a bearer token, essentially, which happens over here by kind of plugging into the execute web request uh, event. Now let's just run this program. I'm going to press F5. It should then ask me for um, a password. If I see somewhere a prompt popping up. All right, here we are. Here is the font slightly smaller. Apologies for that. Um, Okay, then we should hit a breakpoint. So what happened? Let me scroll up a little bit. Um, we are actually now requesting a token. So we call the ensure access token async method. And this is kind of a utility library method. So this, it's similar than the one in, in a PNP site score. So if you are using PNP site score, this is there already today. Uh, and the future PNP site score, once it works for .NET, uh, with CSOM.NET standard, will have this option there as well. So then, then you don't have to uh, worry about this. You can just use a particular method from the application manager class, and you're good to go. Um, but the code itself is quite simple. So we uh, try to get a token from a cache. So we can, if you get a token, we cache it. Uh, if not, we acquire a token. And the token uh, acquiring is actually done over here, which is simply it sent a request, and sorry, this is probably quite small. Let me see if I can zoom this without the pop-up disappearing. No, it doesn't work. But uh, the token endpoint is uh, login microsoftonline.com slash comma slash oauth2 slash token, which is like an endpoint from uh, uh, Microsoft Azure AD. 
and you just say like, okay, give me a token for this resource compared to line and SharePoint.com with this particular client ID uh, and username and password. And then you get a token back. So we press F10 over here. F10. I have a token. You see the long string in, in the pop-up here, which means that if you press F5, we should have things working. So uh, let's go back to the console. Let me zoom in over here. And you see that we uh, it's a very simple test, but it shows that the title for my uh, particular site came back. So overall, to summarize things, it's, it's um, let's stop debugging. Um, the only big difference is, is the way how you get a context, uh, especially if you're using username and password today. If you today are using already like Azure D uh, app only or uh, ACS app only, then things just stay working. Now, the only thing is if you are kind of using SharePoint Online credentials, then you have to use this new approach. Um, and the recommended part is create your own application, Azure AD, uh, and then configure that. I think that's uh, just to go uh, at half of the hour. Um, are there any specific questions? Yeah, so exactly. The main questions are all related on auth, and then would the, the classic uh, app new, rec new, ASPX auth token also work or not? Yeah, that works actually. Yeah, yeah. So you, if you're still using uh, Azure ACS, which is the old system, which still supports by the way, but I would recommend using it's Azure not, AD. But it's not called Azure ACS because it's our SharePoint own my own ACS. But anyway, so well, whatever. <laughs> yeah, ACS uh, <laughs> dot 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 ACS. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, that, that works absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because it but, uh, gives you an access point, token and you just plug it in. It's the same concept, exactly. same process. Yeah. SharePoint Online credentials model doesn't work. All of the other ways do work. So, All right, that's the good summary. Everything else works, but the SharePoint Online credentials doesn't work anymore. Everything that yeah. depends on classic auth, which is a good thing because more and more tenants turn off anyhow the classic auth and then SharePoint Online credentials would still not work anyhow. So it's not something that, that you already could get uh, if you write an application, go to your customer, and the customer might have turned off classic auth and your application with SharePoint Online credentials would already fail today. So it's not, this is already a best practice today if you want to use uh, username and password based authentication. Absolutely. Thank you, Bert, for this one. We'll could definitely come back with a, a additional demos and stuff when the, the season uh, .NET standard yes. is available. We'll, we'll get the documentation well. out and uh, the code sample out and all of that so people can start learning things and, and sharing within their blogs also the use cases. But I think it's time to jump to Tommy and your table and have a look on building Microsoft Teams tabs with Blazor. Okay, topic for today is Blazor in the Microsoft Teams tab. I'm the guy on the left, but I'm way too lazy to change our common master of the page all the time. Thomas Gölle is my name. I'm working as a team lead for Modern Workplace Solutions for our company called Solvian. And this is where you can reach me and all the ego parts, how important the MVPs are, are on the bottom. Um, but the focus of today is what is ASP.NET Blazor and how can we use it in a Teams tab? First of all, what is Blazor? Um, Blazor is nothing else like another web component, another web framework. Um, it's part of ASP.NET. Um, there are two different versions. We will have a look at the two different versions. Both are G8 now. The first one, the server one, was G8 at Ignite last year. The last one, the web assembly one, the client side, was G8 last week at the build conference. And this is actually the, the most interesting one, how we can run really client side, meaning dynamic link libraries in the client. Um, all the things here, um, the main thing is that you write native C sharp code in a web framework. That's very interesting from my perspective. Um, I'm one of those old uh, SharePoint developers that used to work with what just Bert showed us, the CSOM yeah, client side and the old server side object model. And I changed roles when everything SPFX hit uh, the reality, like I think, March 1st, 2017 was the release date of SPFX. And of course, a little bit ironic, but uh, it's three years since then. It's time for a new development model, isn't it? So we are used to have a new one every couple of years. So for me, that's going to be Blazor. Difference between server and client. Um, the server application in, in Blazor runs really on your server is connected to a single R, a signal R connection to your client. So everything stays on the server and only tiny bits and pieces are communicated to the client. Um, the client updates regularly whenever something changes. You have this method called status change where you can push a re-render of the client. And also 
of course, the client needs to be online. That provides you with a smaller download size compared to the real client side server, a client side blazer. And it's a way better place to store your credentials and secrets. Why? Because on the client side version of Blazor, we are using WebAssembly. We are only using WebAssembly on the client side version of Blazor. So server side is like a regular ASP.NET architecture web application server, but the client is the new thing really pushing DLLs out to your client. On the client, we are running a mono runtime in a security sandbox like uh, your browser is using for JavaScript today already. It works on all major browsers. The only one with an, an polyfill exception is uh, Internet Explorer 11, but it runs on mobile phones, it runs on Safari, it runs on Firefox, Chrome, whatever. Um, it's a little bit slower than the server side uh, component, and as it runs on the client, it's not the perfect place to store probably your connection string to your Azure table, for example, because if you think of it, you're sending the whole application to the client upfront. That means you have a larger initial download size. For my simple demo, it already was like eight or nine megabytes, but everything in there can be looked into from, let's say, a bad person. You can decombine those DLLs, so that's not a good idea to hardcore store your credentials in there. For that, you need to talk to a server again. And the interesting part for me especially is WebAssembly Laser runs also in an Azure Static website. So we can go serverless in terms of running those applications because what happens is that at the first hit, the client downloads the whole application, the initial application, and then it can be taken offline. It can be a progressive web application. And with the use of Azure Static websites, we don't even need to care from a server perspective for operations anymore. Um, what I'm going to look today is basically this is a uh, a screenshot of the example, and we will have a look on how the authentication flow from Teams to your Blazor tab uh, is working, how you can call the graph, how you can get the current Teams token, and then we have a short demo how we blaze at the PNP team. Okay, enough for PowerPoint. Let's move on with the code. And the page is already running. Um, I'm running this locally uh, here in my Visual Studio uh, instance. And of course, I'm using ng-rock to publish uh, what is running locally on my machine, so can reuse that uh, as a tab inside of my team. And when I click here on reloading the tab, uh, I will hit the endpoint, and you will see there's a redirect because we're doing the exact same thing that Bert uh, already showed us. So we're using the same flow in the background and the same access token, uh, ID token uh, thing. I also have here in my other tenant because I'm using a multi-tenant app registration at the moment, but I'm using also app registrations in Microsoft Azure. I've defined all my endpoints because I need those because I have a start page and an end page. And what actually happens in the code is in my index file in Blazor, I can use JavaScript. So this allows me to copy and paste everything I found in terms of the Microsoft Teams site. There was a, there's a nice Node.js example on GitHub, and I just grabbed the code and put the authentication in the silent way from there. So I'm using the Microsoft Teams SDK. I'm using Adel.js. I'm creating my context, creating my configuration for the Adel flow, and at some point hitting acquire token and then I'm getting a graph token. And the, the, the tricky part more or less is how do I get this token from the JavaScript world to the Blazor world? And luckily it's very easy. We just store it in the local storage. And why is that so easy? Um, because what actually happens under the cover already, if you look at the local storage, all those variables, everything with ADL and except from the Teams context, the underscore and the ADL access token underscore is already happening by ADL chess. So it's already storing the credentials there. And I just thought, okay, why not making it sure that I have my own version of the token as well present so that I can make sure that it's my variable storing the token there. And then I'm just grabbing the token inside of Blazor and using it. And what can I do? First of all, I can call the Teams context. 
because I'm doing the same thing. I'm storing the Teams context that I get from the Teams SDK in my local storage. And then in Blazor, I'm just grabbing it. And here is all my detailed information. At the moment, I'm running a personal tab. That's why the team side path and the team side URL is empty. But if you deploy this tab to a team, for example, then you will get also the reference to the SharePoint parts, and then you can connect uh, one step further. I can go and call the Microsoft Graph. It's just a simple call using an HTTP client, because what can I do? I have here a graph service in C Sharp, and I'm just using an HTTP client, and I'm taking my token. And this is the backend code. This is like a real service in ASP.NET Core. Um, what is actually running on the front end? Let's move over to this component here. That's called a Razor component. And the Razor component is a way of combining HTML over here with actually C Sharp code. And of course, I know uh, this code should only be, or the idea is that you only use C Sharp in this file here to render stuff, to have your render logic in there, and to have your business logic somewhere else. But it's pretty easy. You just call or you load your Vero token in there because I'm getting it from the local storage. So I'm grabbing local storage, get item async, my access token. I have the token now, and then I can call my graph service with the token, get uh, me with HTTP client. I'm calling basically the method from over here, and I'm getting back the JSON string and can show it in my client over here. Same thing, uh, I can not only use the HTTP client, but I could also use the native graph client. For example, these are all the teams in this small development tenant where I have a, a nicer representation. And you already see I'm all played with a uh, NuGet package called, I think, Blazor Fabric that uh, makes use of the Fluent uh, UI already, because when you get one step deeper, I can ask for a detail list. So getting getting more examples, and I have a small uh, user interface back here. I can need to re-render stuff that I'm trying to to get rid of. But what I can do now, I have my team selected and get details. And in the details, I have this nice pane here, and here I get all the apps that are installed in this team. So this component talks to the graph, get all teams. So get all groups uh, that are teams. And then when I click one, master detail view, nice uh, flyout from the right, like we are used in Office 65, and all the details, another call. How is this done? Back to the code. I have my graph service here. I have get all teams. I'm actually using the graph service client with the built-in delegate authentication provider, because this provider has a constructor that takes an existing bureau token. So I'm reusing my token that I already stored and already grabbed from the Teams SDK through my local storage, and now I create a new graph service client. And from there, it's just C Sharp and calling the different endpoints, grabbing all the groups, getting through, and getting all the apps, and resurface it on the other side of the browser. So that's very, very easy. And all you see here basically was built in I think three or five evenings, and I'm not a day-to-day -day developer anymore. I'm more on the architecture side, so that's the, the whole reason why it's interesting for me to use Razor. I'm not used to uh, live in TypeScript and SharePoint framework. I am yeah have my experience from 10 years back writing stuff in .NET, but with this, I'm good to go at least to write some cool uh, proof of concept in that way. And the last one I want to show is like, okay, how can we interact with JavaScript as well? So I created this modern PNP team rooster, and then you get the idea why there is so much Windows XP references in here, because I found a CSS library that mimics XP, and of course, uh, a Chris Kent tribute, you should always include horses in your demo. So that's why there are small horses in here. Let us zoom in. So you see here what you can also do with that. Um, and then we can move on and make it also in Windows 98 style. Um, what, how is that done? 
let's go back and look at our Blazor PNP team service. Actually, I'm a little bit paranoid about my demos, so I'm fetching this this chunks of data live from the PNP GitHub uh, website. So I'm grabbing all the details of this, the, the members, all the dates, all the, the data endpoints from the website because I was afraid to misspell or forget someone. So grabbing those things here and then in my Razor component, it's pretty easy. Loading all the PNP team members and then for each awesome person in the PNP team, I'm rendering a diff. And then, oh, I forgot about someone because there is, of course, a special shout out to my friend Stefan Bauer. We'll have that in a minute. But I'm just visualizing for every person in that collection, I'm creating a diff. And going back, it's rendered here. And what you can do is that you can click on all, you can try to click down Elio or click down Erwin. But when you click on Stefan, he will come back with a typical Viennese sentence. Uh, yeah how how funny he is. Um, to wrap things up and to not go back to PowerPoint, uh, what you saw, there are two versions of Blazor. There's a server side and everything you saw today is the server side Blazor. I still need to think about how I can get the client side working with the authentication because different is also the routing is different. Uh, for a client side application, there is there are no fixed routes. You need to use the library for that and I need to find a way to make that possible with this uh, pop-up flow as long as there is no uh, single sign on for Teams tabs. But if you go back to the build uh, conference videos from last week, Nick Kramer showed what will come to Teams in terms of SSO. So tabs and bots will also be supported there. Some references to uh, people I looked up, Jeffrey Fritz from the product manager for the ASP.NET and .NET community team with cool and I think eight hours of daily streaming on Twitch about Blazor, community links, Blazor Fluent UI, and then if you think of what is possible with Blazor in the future for Teams tab, um, if singles and on is working, of course, those tabs that I showed you today, and then load everything with the client side version of Blazor to a static website, and you have a serverless interface. 15 minutes and I'm done. Excellent. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, we might go a few minutes long today, so just a word of a warning because uh, we promised some t extra time for Yannick. But uh, thank you, Tommy. Really cool stuff. It's, it's great to see this in, in practice and see how easy it is to actually do development. And that's, I think that's the promise of the Blazor, absolutely. So yep. if you're familiar with C Sharp, you don't have to learn about what is this thing about TypeScript and C and JavaScript. So absolutely. Yep. But thank you for that one. Uh, Yannick, you're next in line, uh, to, uh, so let's jump on your screen. Yep. So, hello everyone. So, my name is Yannick Prinzvo. I'm a solution architect around Microsoft 365, founder of my own company. And today I will speak about site designs and um, how can power user can actually use them. So, just a quick reminder of what site designs are. There are uh, there are actually uh, standard capability in, for site provisioning in SharePoint Online. And basically they have the same purpose as classic templates that we had in the past, but they are techn technically a bit different. They are not a base template um, on which the assets are created from, but they are actually a sequence of actions of customization that you want to apply after the asset is created. So. Um, it allowed to achieve ba basic provisioning, but for more complex scenarios, I would definitely recommend still to go to the PMP template uh, provisioning uh, solution because they, they are more advanced and so the site design won't be the good fit for more complex scenario. And so they are composed of site script that are the building blocks of the site design and they are expressed in the JSON format. To manage them on the official documentation, Microsoft documentation, you will see a few ways, uh, the, primarily the REST API and also with the SPO management shell, PNP PowerShell or Office 365 CLI. So basically there are technical ways to manage them, to create them, edit them, add them and so on. And 
there is, for now at least, no out of the box user interface available um, from, from Microsoft. So, design designs and size script, those are the two concepts that uh, we have to know about when working with side designs. A side design is actually an entity that has some properties and it has a preview image, it has a name and so on, and it is based on one of the two base template uh, in modern SharePoint site, so modern team or communication site. And we'll see in a minute in the demo uh, how it looks in the in the SharePoint interface, but we won't go too deep on this for now. And the site script, on the other hand, are the building blocks uh, of site design, and so they have a name and description, but the they have overall um, a content that is expressed in JSON, something like this. And this JSON contains actually a um, sequence of site actions, so a sequence of all the customizations and, and, and provisioning bits that you want to apply to your tenant. So let's see, for example, we have a site design and we have three site scripts here. And um, the, the site design is actually basically a container that will, uh, not really a container, but an entity that will be linked to different site designs. And the, the uh, different site scripts, sorry. Site scripts um, live on their own and site design live on their own as well, but they are actually associated together. For instance, here we have an example of a marketing site design and three site scripts with different purposes, one for applying branding customization, one for the information architecture, and another one for installing installing application on the target site. But those building blocks are really interesting because if, for example, we add a new site design here, we can actually reuse the bits uh, and link them to another site design. And site designs for power users. So, Power users actually have good command of SharePoint concepts, so they know what the, the what are the concepts of SharePoint, what are the list, content type, fields, the, all the basics of SharePoint. They know how to use them, but they know how to use them mainly from from the from the UI, from the SharePoint interface. And so, power users are not IT pros. They might be, but they might not be. And so, what PowerShell or what Office 365 CLI mean for them, not much. And obviously, they are neither uh, pro developers. So the REST API and JSON might be very difficult for, for them to, to, to use. And so with all that in mind, they actually might want any way to, um, to be able to automate the customization that they have done on one side, they want probably to use them uh, on, a, on another side and uh, to automate the way that those customizations are provisioned to other sites as well. And I came up then with a, a solution that I called Site Design Studio. It is actually now a V2 that I will demo today. The, it will, there was a V1 from already two years ago that was a single work part. Um, a single SPFX web part. This new um, application is uh, so uh, a world application, actually uh, an app part page SPFX application that will come with its own SharePoint modern site, so a dedicated site to host this application. And it allows to basically manage site design and site script and overall site script without really the need to understand uh, JSON. There are some uh, exceptions for this, for this because some of the, of the actions are more complex. So, But the, 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 the main point is that they won't have to do any PowerShell or, or to use the CLI, and they won't uh, need to, to, to know anything about the REST API. It is an open source application that is hosted on the PNP GitHub repository. So the URL is here. So, but time for demo now. And let's go to it already. So it is how it looks like the, the, the home 
uh, home page of this application. So you see it is a dedicated site for it. So we have on the home page, we have uh, the, the, the preview of, of some site designs available in my tenant, and we have uh, the preview of some sites we have available already in my tenant. So if I add a site design, for example, you see that I have this editor here that I can call whatever I want. I have to select uh, if I want it to be based on team site or communication site. It is one of the two main base templates that are used. There are not more. Um, and some description. And also, we have the possibility to add a preview image. <laughs> For example, I can use this one that is actually this image is hosted in this particular site. It is one of the benefits of having um a dedicated site for the application so we don't really have to 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 put an image from elsewhere and take care of hosting it um so if i save this like this uh, and i go for instance on the sharepoint home page you can see that here i see my new site design that were not, was not existing but I won't use it as is because it, actually it is not different from a standard um, site because I did not put any customization in it. And to put some customization, as I said in the in the slide, we have to associate it actually to site script. And so for now, I have on, only one available um, site script that is this one. And I can add it like this, but we won't use it uh for for now this is this one we can delete actually so from the side script we have the, the quite similar interface we can add a new one and we go we go with a blank one for now so side script uh, demo test and here i have also a picker to add the actions uh, to my site script. So all the capabilities of provisioning and customizing that the site script offers. So I have, uh, for instance, I can create a list. I can say my list. And you see on the right that the code is automatically reflecting the, the change that I'm doing on the UI. Uh, on my list, I will add a uh, a flash here, okay. Uh, on my list, I will add um, uh, a content type, and I will call it my content type. But as you might have understood already, uh, it is a script. So I mean a sequence of action. So and it will be added to a brand new site. So this content type won't be existing in my new site so i have to add it as well so i can create a site content type here and say type is it will be inheriting the item standard content type it won't be hidden but just to be sure i will toggle this thing uh group yeah okay and so another thing that you might have uh, noted is that this is uh, another sequence so this content type that i'm using in the list uh, i i have to create it before i actually create the list so i will reorder the thing here like this and i will do the same with uh, a side column, a side column that will be a text field done. Okay, and it will be required. Yes, and group. And again, I have to um, reorder because I will add this side column in my content type. So what was the name? System. OK, 
okay, okay. And you see that I have the JSON that has been generated. So now I can save. And with this uh, site script saved, uh, actually it is already saved in my tenant, but uh, it is not associated to anything. So the application proposed me if I want to already associate it or not. So I can say yes, and I will say I want to use a new site design. And here it is, we see it is already here. So I, I will try another feature and see how uh, it works with the actual site design applied to the site. So for this one, I will uh, actually go to site script again and add a new site script. And you see that here I have another option that is from site. So I have another site that I created earlier, a simple site with some customization with a, a custom list here, research areas and some theming, etc. And I will, will use it from here. So from site, it is called research. So I can search for it. And you see that I have to specify the list that I want to include. And I will say, I want to include this research area. And I can do add site script here. And you see that everything is already uh, grabbed from the SharePoint API. From the SharePoint, there is an API actually that is used to extract a site script, a site script from an existing site. So test PNP as the name test here. I will save it and I will say, okay, I want to do associate it to a new site uh, design. So team P, I will say it is a team site because it's the same template as my previous site. And from here, I will add an image from my computer. So let's use this. And okay, I think I'm good to go. Let's save it. And so from my original site, you see that I have this research area uh, list that has some column formatting on the list and um, has um, a custom content type. We don't see it here. Uh, we, we see the fields actually, but we don't see that it is it is a custom one. And so from here, let me just refresh the page. I can use create a site, select team site. And so from demo PNP, you see my preview image. Demo PNP01. And we can click next. and finish. And so from here, it depends sometimes we don't see it actually. There is a banner that says that there is a site script or site design applying. We don't see it here, but from the site design, we will probably see it, yes. And yes, there was a, um, a fail action from here, but each, it should have applied the, the other customization. So if I refresh the page, we see actually, so we have the branding, we have the research area list that has been created. And if I, you see that I have my custom um, content type, the item is still there because the extract API doesn't remove anything. It just add the, 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 the added content from the original one. So test. And you see, you should see that it has the um, few formatting on the list as well. Okay, and it, it is basically it, but there is a, some other features also from this one let's see that for example we want to uh, we have done all this work on this 
uh, development tenant and we want to apply it to, uh, to the production customer, uh, the customer production tenant, we can actually use a feature that is export here. So we have a way to extract it with PNP PowerShell or as raw JSON as PNP PowerShell, uh, Office CLI PowerShell or with Bash. And actually you have a demo here, uh, uh, download, sorry, download button that you can click and you get the file with the JSON and the PowerShell script to execute on another tenant. And lastly, if you don't know where to start, you can try actually another feature that I had it recently, recently, it is the from sample. So you might know this site here, um, the samples from the PNP repository. And you see in the samples, a lot of samples already existing. And from the site design studio, you can click from sample and you see all the samples available. Some of them might not work because it actually uh, assumes that the JSON file, there is one JSON file that is the size script at the root of the sample. Uh, and it's not the case for all of them. But for instance, if I take the first one, I see the readme file from the GitHub and I see the JSON and I can, cl can click as at new type script and I have the content already there. And I think that's it for me. Excellent, excellent, Yannick. Really cool stuff. Uh, we do do apologize. I once again talk too long uh, on the community call, so it took slightly longer today than expected. But really, really cool stuff. And the the GitHub repo was already shared uh, in the in the chat. We'll share it in the notes as well. So for those who are watching the YouTube video, the recording, go to the YouTube video notes and the video reference, and and you will get access on the sample. And and there's I think you had really good guidance on how to set it up and and get started on it, right? Yes, there is actually uh, um, uh, a readme file that tells just a, a couple of parameters to, to, to put to a partial script and uh, yeah. it applies everything uh, normally yep. smoothly. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Yannick. Now uh, let's close up uh, for this one. So thank you uh, for all of the presenters. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, Tommy. And thank you, Yannick. And the recording will be available within 24 hours in the YouTube channel, the normal one. Uh, and then the next Microsoft 365 general special interest group call is within two weeks, Thursday at 7 a.m. Pacific time. The next SharePoint framework community call is week from now, 7 a.m. Pacific time. And the, the next SharePoint monthly community call is on June 9th. Next week, uh, there will be Microsoft Craft Community Call, at least on Tuesday, unless I'm completely mistaken, uh, which is a good if you're interested on in those topics as well. Now, a uh, quick recap also on the upcoming calls. We do have a lot of calls. We're looking into potentially um, consolidating these, but at the same time, a lot of the community people have been repeating that please don't shut down the calls. It's good to have more, um, more calls, and then you can check the recording if you can't join the call. But I think that's it for now. So sorry for taking slightly longer time today and then expect that. Um, but thank you for the presenters. Thank you for the active discussion on the chat window. That's always super beneficial for everybody who's joining. And thank you for being part of the community. So thank you for this one. And the recording will be available within 24 hours in the YouTube community channel. And there will be a blog post with all of the references and all of that. And if you really, really need to get access on latest slides and pictures, I think David Warner is submitting and the screenshot uh, uh, summary uh, quite fast typically after this call, slightly depending on if he has other things on his table. But that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back within a week. Bye-bye. Thank <music> you.